So in the last video, we said that just as in chapter seven, the market demand curve is downward sloping. That is that people want to buy more as the price goes down and will buy less as the price goes up, right? And that represents the market's willingness to pay. But each firm uh, in perfect competition, uh, when they are price takers, has no control over the price, which means that they face a completely flat demand curve. They can sell as much as they want at the market price, but they can't sell at a higher price, right? Which means in this case that they have no choice over uh, the price. So that's why we call them price taking firms. So they can only choose the quantity. And so what does that mean? Well, one thing it means is that setting the slope of the ISO profit curve equal to the slope of the demand curve means that firms maximize profits uh, where the slope of the ISO profit curve is zero right here at point A. So it's just it's the flat point on the ISO profit curve right there. And that's going to be where the marginal cost equals price, because in this case, price equals marginal revenue. Now, this is a little bit different than a price setting firm. Remember, when a firm is a price setting firm, they face a trade off between lowering the price and selling more versus raising the price and selling less. And so the marginal revenue curve is actually downward sloping. In this case, the marginal revenue curve is just that firm's demand curve. It's just flat equal to the price, the market price. And so firms take that price as given in perfect competition. They can't benefit from choosing a different price. If they uh, increase their price from according from the market price, they won't sell any. And there's no point in uh, reducing the price from the market price because uh, while they can sell, uh, they are already selling as much as they want to at the market price. So their feasible set is, is you know, below the market price, they will set a, uh, a quantity where the marginal cost is equal to the price and that's where they maximize profits. Now in the short term, they could be earning some positive profits, but it's important to remember here that accounting profits and economic profits are different, right? So economic profits uh, take into account all of the opportunity costs that the firm uh, could use their capital for instead of uh, whatever they are doing, in this case, uh, baking bread and, and producing loaves of bread. Um, and so there could be some accounting profit. We'll see later on in this chapter that if a market is earning positive economic profits, then firms will enter the market and we would expect those economic profits uh, to fall to zero. So thinking about that supply curve, one way to think about that supply curve is that it's simply uh, marginal cost, right? We said the firm's uh, supply curve is marginal cost and we're assuming here that the marginal cost curve is upward sloping. Uh, remember, we said that the marginal cost curve could be downward sloping for a little while while firms uh, enjoy economies of scale, but then eventually we would expect it to be upward sloping again. And so if all the firms are the same and they all have identical cost functions, then the market supply curve will just be the market marginal cost curve. Uh, but that might not be the case, right? There could be differences in uh, technology and marginal costs. And so it could be that um, as the price goes up, more firms enter um, because they find it profitable to do so. And that could lead to an upward sloping uh, supply curve as well. Um, but it will definitely be related to marginal costs, um, and which is why we uh, generally make the, the supply curve upward sloping. So if we think about the competitive equilibrium, right? In this case, remember point A, where the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied. Uh, here we have a price of two euros and 5,000 uh, loaves of bread. All buyers and sellers are price takers, meaning that all bread is sold at two euros. Buyers can buy as much bread as they want at two euros and sellers can sell as much bread as they want at two euros. And at that price, that price is special because it clears the market, right? So all of those buyers who want to buy bread at two euros and all of those sellers who want to sell bread at two euros can find each other. Um, that means that all of those sales that could take place are taking place, which means that our competitive equilibrium is efficient. Um, so under these assumptions where all participants are price takers, which means we have lots of firms, lots of buyers, uh, the 
goods are all identical. So that loaf of bread I buy at one baker is the same as the loaf of bread I buy at the other bakers. Contracts are complete, meaning that there's complete information. So for instance, I as a buyer know that if some uh, baker is trying to sell bread at uh, two euros 50, that I can go uh, get the bread you know, around the corner at that other baker for two euros. Um, and in that case, uh, then we maximize total surplus, right? And remember, consumer surplus is this area above the price and under the demand curve, and producer surplus is the area above the supply curve and uh, below the price. So that means there's no dead weight loss. Remember before in Chapter 7, firms would price somewhere up here on their demand curve, and we would get a triangle uh, of dead weight loss. It's also important to think about the fact that uh, we're assuming that there's no externalities, right? There's no external effects like pollution um, that would create costs on other people than the buyers and sellers. So it's important to think about this is a nice model um, and it has a lot of useful features, um, but it's only as good as its assumptions, right? Just like all models are only as good as their assumptions. Um, and if those assumptions don't hold, then the allocation may not be Pareto efficient, right? So, for example, we just said in the last slide that if we have negative externalities, right, if all these bakers are producing a lot of pollution and putting it into the air, or dumping it into the water, putting costs onto other people, then uh, our equilibrium outcome would not be uh, Pareto efficient. Um, it also doesn't say anything about fairness, right? So there's been a, throughout history, there's sort of been a lot of questions about a just price versus an unjust price. Um, and you still see it sometimes, for instance, after natural disasters, where all of a sudden people have a large demand for water or for snow shovels or for, you know, building equipment. And so demand increases, that increases the price significantly. And all of a sudden, people feel like they're not paying a fair price because, uh, it's a lot higher than it was before the natural disaster. And of course, that's true. Um, but the reason for that is because of the increase in demand uh, and sometimes as well a decrease in supply because of the natural disaster. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of this depends on firms being price takers, right? And while Consumers are often price takers. We don't usually haggle over the price. We usually take the price that's uh, set by the firm, at least in you know, developed countries. Uh, many firms do everything they can to avoid being price takers. So they try to differentiate their products as much as possible. But you know, if they do produce a commodity, um, you know, like an agricultural product, you know, whether that's meat or milk or corn um, or aluminum or steel, then there isn't much they can do. And so in those ma markets, uh, firms do tend to be price takers, but it will mean usually that their profits are going to be lower.